As I said at the very beginning of this series, the Romans were never particularly disposed to invention and creativity, but they were masters of co-option and assimilation. In Rome, no good idea went unadopted, and in Greece, Cicero saw good ideas everywhere. But as much as he contributed to the cultural enrichment of Rome, Cicero saw himself primarily as a politician and pointed to his political career above his philosophical or legal pursuits as the achievement he was most proud of. After serving in the legions with resigned ill humor during the social war, Cicero started his legal career in the 80s BC, quickly garnering a reputation as a great orator. But after defending a man in a murder trial and pointing the finger at a sullen ally while Sulla still sat on the throne, Cicero took a pragmatic extended tour of Greece until the affair blew over. While in Greece, he was put into contact with the masters of Greek philosophy and rhetoric, and Cicero perfected a unique oratorical style that would make him the acknowledged master of his day. In 75 BC, he was elected quaestor for Sicily and endeared himself to the locals for his relatively honest dealings. They ultimately asked him to take on a politically dangerous case, prosecuting the Roman governor of Sicily on charges of corruption. Cicero finally agreed and spun the trial into his big break, successfully prosecuting the governor, whose corruption far exceeded the acceptable standards of the day. From that point on, he was on the fast track, achieving every step of the cursus honorum in his year, finally winning the consulship in 64 BC for a term to be served the following year. Catiline, though defeated by Cicero in that election, was undeterred and ran again the next year. But amidst a trial for his role in the sullen purges spearheaded by Cato the Younger and a lack of support from his wealthy benefactors, Crassus among them, who had supported him as an antidote to senatorial domination, Catiline's last campaign never got off the ground. His career was effectively over, and had he been born in another age, he may have sulked and raged, but would have gone on with his life and found other outlets for his passions. But in this age, he was able to see his final defeat as merely an advisory decision. And more importantly, he was able to find other men who were ready to help him expose the man behind the curtain. Catiline began to conspire actively with other disaffected citizens. Their aim was simple, overthrow the government. Now, Catiline was motivated by personal delusions of grandeur and driven to such extreme measures out of an inflamed sense of bitterness. The men he gathered around his plot, however, were almost uniformly brought on board out of a base material self-interest. From the upper classes, he found indebted nobles and corrupt ex-senators who had been purged from the rolls by the censors. Men who wanted power but couldn't have it, and men who owed money but didn't want to pay it. Catiline promised them access back to control and a cancellation of all debts once he was in charge. From the lower classes, he stoked the bitterness of landless veterans and indebted commoners. Up and down the line, the message was the same. Once we overthrow the government, everyone will get everything they ever desire. Land, money, house, the whole kit and caboodle. This was not an ideological revolution. This was naked self-interest writ large. In Etruria, an ex-centurion named Gaius Manlius began gathering an army. It is unclear how connected Manlius and Catiline were at this point, but it speaks volumes that when Catiline was exiled after his plot was exposed, he headed straight for the force Manlius had assembled. In Rome, the plan was to kick off the coup by assassinating Cicero. From there, strategically located conspirators would begin setting fires across the city and generally plunge Rome into chaos. At least, that's what Cicero reported to the Senate the day after he was notified of the assassination plot. Cicero's informant had apparently gotten word to the consul of the threat, and Cicero posted extra guards, foiling the would-be assassins. There's a great deal of ambiguity about whether any of this is true, but Cicero outlined the whole affair so eloquently and blamed Catiline so thoroughly that the Senate came to believe the charges. Famously, as the Senate listened to Cicero, they moved one by one away from Catiline, who was eventually left sitting by himself, physically and politically isolated. I'm not exaggerating when I say that Cicero's Catalinarian orations are still held up today as some of the finest rhetoric ever uttered by man. 
Now, how much Cicero was exaggerating is another story completely. There is speculation that while Catiline was indeed up to something, the assassination attempt may have been invented by Cicero to secure the near dictatorial powers he needed to deal with the alleged crisis. It is further speculated that he wanted those powers not to deal with the specific machinations of Catiline and his conspirators, but rather to lay the groundwork for a defense of the Republic against Pompey, who was presently on his way home from the east at the head of a large veteran army and with more money at his disposal than the Roman treasury had ever held. Cicero wanted to make sure that any internal strife in Rome was quashed before Pompey returned. Both Marius and Sulla had been able to exploit political divisions in the city in their quest for power. Cicero wanted to deny Pompey a similar opportunity. Catiline, now a pariah, agreed to go into exile, but lied about his destination and instead headed for Etruria to join Manlius's growing army, Catiline overseeing the operation in Rome. But the remaining conspirators were not particularly adept at their jobs. They attempted to entice a group of Gallic emissaries to join their cause, but the visiting Gauls simply took the opportunity to earn the goodwill of the Senate by exposing the plot. They talked five of the leading conspirators into affixing their name to a letter promising the Gauls they were fully committed to rebellion. The careless plotters forgot the first and second rule of Fight Club, and when the Gauls presented the document to the Senate, the five men were arrested and the conspiracy inside Rome was short-circuited. Cicero and Cato led the charge in the Senate to have the men executed at once. Julius Caesar opposed the death sentence, arguing that exile was preferable. It would not set a good precedent to have men of senatorial rank executed without trial. But with Cicero and Cato arguing that punishment must be swift and harsh, the Senate relented and ordered the five strangled. For the rest of his career, Cicero's enemies would bring up this bloodthirsty and illegal railroading of Roman citizens against him. Cicero's exile during the chaos of the subsequent year would be based largely on his actions towards the five conspirators on that day. Certainly, his actions subtly undercut every argument he would ever make about the need to respect the rule of law and the constitution of Rome. With the inside men gone, the whole plot quickly imploded. Mass desertions from the insurgent army forced Manlius and Catiline to leave those left around the countryside, studiously avoiding the legions they encountered. Eventually, though, they were cornered and forced to fight. The rebels, little more than a mob, were destroyed. Sallust makes a point of reporting that Catiline was killed while fighting on the front line, and unlike many of his men, died of frontal wounds, not wounds in the back, the dishonorable sign that a man was killed. The final verdict on Catiline was that he was a courageous, ambitious, and corrupt man who concocted a plot far more ambitious than his abilities warranted. He was forced to ally himself with the dregs of both Roman nobility and the lower classes, and he was easily bested by better men. He was outmaneuvered by Cicero at nearly every step, never standing a chance against Rome's greatest politician. The conspiracy of Catiline was an instant legend in Roman history both for the central role played by Cicero and because it provided a blueprint for how not to organize the coup. Julius Caesar, of course, was right there the whole time, no doubt taking notes, mentally or otherwise. I like to imagine that somewhere in those notes, in big bold letters, is the line, Make sure Cicero is out of the way. Next week, Julius Caesar, young senator on the rise, will make his first attempt to make sure that Cicero is out of the way. Not by attacking him, but by asking him to join an informal alliance of mutual support that was being formed between Crassus, Pompey, and Caesar. Cicero refused the invitation, correctly identifying the first triumvirate, as it came to be known, as a mortal enemy of the Republic he set up. Initially, the threat came primarily from Pompey and Crassus, with Caesar seen as little more than a pawn in the game. But the first triumvirate would spell the end of the Republic, not for the power it gave Pompey and Crassus, but for the money and support that it gave Caesar, in whom, you may recall, Sulla saw many Amarius. There will probably be no episode next week, as I'm scheduled to fly to visit the history of Roman laws for what they call Christmas, but what we all know is the Feast of the Unconquered Sun. 
However, as I sit here, Portland has been crippled by severe weather, so who knows if I'll ever actually make it out of town. So if there's no episode, you've been warned, and if there is, happy Saturnalia. Episode 39, The Young Julius Caesar Chronicles. Last time, we covered Catiline's ill-fated conspiracy during the consulship of Cicero in 63 BC. This week, I want to backtrack a bit and fill in some of the gaps on our way to the formation of the alliance between Pompey, Crassus, and Julius Caesar in 60 BC, now called the First Triumvirate. In the aftermath of Spartacus's slave revolt, Pompey and Crassus had served as co-consuls, and though they functioned well enough publicly, Personally, they were bitter rivals, or at least Crassus was bitter rivals with Pompey. I'm not really sure how much thought Pompey ever gave to Crassus. After their shared consulship, they were glad to be rid of each other. It was not until a decade later that they were brought together again, this time by a man who would soon be consul himself and desperately needed allies in his coming flame war with the Senate, Gaius Julius Caesar. And when I say fill in some gaps, it turns out what I really meant is write a sprawling, double-length episode on Caesar's early career. Gaius Julius Caesar was born in 100 BC into the ancient patrician Julii family. Though the family traced their lineage back to Aeneas, and thus to the goddess Venus herself, they had, in recent generations, fallen on hard times. While they always maintained respectability, they had long since passed to the margins of Roman political life. Caesar's particular branch was on the margins of Roman economic life as well, and the boy grew up in a neighborhood called the Subaru, which was far, both geographically and culturally, from the estates of his fellow patrician nobles on the Palatine Hill. I think it goes without saying that being raised in what amounted to a tenement building owned by his parents had a great impact on Caesar's later populist politics. Yes, he had impeccable patrician credentials, but Caesar would always identify himself with the common man and position himself as their champion. His childhood and early career were defined by two women, his mother, Aurelia, and his aunt, Julia. With his father, also named Gaius Julius Caesar, forever away on state business and dead by the time Caesar was 15, it was up to his mother to raise him. And with the time, and held up as the ideal Roman woman by later historians, she came from a family of consuls and made sure that her son had the education and grooming necessary to follow in the footsteps of his maternal forefathers. The other great woman in Caesar's life was his Aunt Julia, who was married to none other than our old friend Gaius Marius. The marriage had been a boon to both families, as Marius needed patrician endorsement to keep his political career moving forward, and the Julii needed the money and fame that Marius brought with him. Though Caesar and Marius probably had limited contact with one another, the marriage joined Caesar at the hip to Marius politically, in some years for better, and in some years, obviously, for the worse. It is a testament, though, to the esteem Julia was held in, that when Sulla returned to Rome, the wife of his worst enemy, and mother of the young man he had so recently defeated on the battlefield, was herself left off the prescription lists. Caesar's first step into public life was very nearly his last. At the age of 